Nearly 20 years ago, I was innocently sitting in an auditorium, blissfully unaware that my life was about to change forever. I had just started the Harvard Business School. I was just about to take a course on the making of America. And over the months that followed, I just sat there awestruck by some of the most captivating stories that I'd ever heard. This was history like I'd never heard it before. It was history that wasn't full of facts and figures. It was full of the flesh and blood of these extraordinary entrepreneurs who made America. And I was just completely hooked. So within the space of a year, I had uh, convinced my wife that it was a brilliant idea for me to turn down all of my job offers and spend several months uh, living on our credit card, starting a business. Um, and Sarah, who uh, was six months pregnant at the time, took it pretty heroically, I think it's fair to say. Um, but I decided one thing more, that one day I would try and write the book about how Britain was made, not with a load of facts and figures, but with the flesh and blood of the great entrepreneurs who helped build this country, a country that is still now the world's fifth biggest economy. This is country of ours was not just built by sovereigns and statesmen, wasn't just built by soldiers and scientists, it was built by some of the greatest entrepreneurs on the planet. It was built by buccaneers like Robert Rich, who founded the great colonies and companies of North America. It was founded by merchants like Thomas Diamond Pitt, who created great trading empires and multinationals amidst the old economies of the East. It was created by industrial revolutionaries like Matthew Bolton, who perfected the steam engine that pumped the mines and drove the forges in the factories of the Industrial Revolution. It was created by great capitalists like Nathan Rothschild, who down the road founded the world's great bond market. It was created by people like William Jardine, um, who forced the argument for free trade in the early 19th century. It was built by visionaries like Cadbury and Lever, who brought mass production to everything from chocolate to soap and brought the products of the whole world to every corner of the country. And for a nation of shopkeepers, our economy was also built by business genius like John Speed and Lewis. Although I loved startup land, although I loved being an entrepreneur, I'm actually the son of two public servants, a science teacher and a council worker. And when my mum died of cancer when she was just 52, I knew at that stage that I was going to have to follow them into public service one day. And so I decided to stand for Parliament, and I was lucky. I got elected and I clambered up the greasy pole fairly quickly, and I did all the difficult jobs that no one wanted to do, and I tackled them with gusto, and, well, you know, it didn't make me too many friends, and I made a lot of enemies along the way, and I made a lot of mistakes along the way, principal amongst which was, of course, my leaving note at the Treasury. <laughs> joking that there was no money. And of course, David Cameron picked up that stick and he used it to beat us remorselessly throughout the last election. Well, I, I look back in retrospect and I think, gosh, if only we had debt that level today. But you know, that, um, that stick, which, uh, which was sort of, you know, beaten around our head, it brought me a tremendous sense of public shame. But what, of course, I couldn't say at the time was that that was completely overwhelmed by the private shame I'd felt as I lost my father to a 20-year struggle against alcohol. So after the last election, I was at an all-time low. His death and uh, our election defeat just brought me to my, to my lowest ebb. And it was at that moment that I just was not sure what on earth I was going to do. I was you know, considering leaving public life. And I took myself off to see the wisest man I know, who's my uncle, a great man who's been through everything. And he, he walked me up to the top of the cliff at the back of his house where he lives in Dorset and overlooking the English Channel, he gave me this extraordinary advice that I had never heard before. And it's a line from Samuel Beckett. He said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And I'd never heard it before, but I suddenly saw that that was the wisdom in each and every one of these entrepreneurial stories. They've taken Kipling's advice to look at triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Robert Rich was almost hounded out of the country by Charles I. He was about to emigrate before his fortune turned. Um, Thomas Diamond Pitt made a fortune, lost a fortune fighting the French, and then had to pick himself up and do it all again. Matthew Bolton is constantly on the brink of bankruptcy, and when the Millers burn down Albion Mill just down the river, he almost loses everything. He's got to pick himself up and do it all again. The Cadbury brothers were on the brink of bankruptcy for much of their early career until they found a way of turning the corner. And John Speed and Lewis almost died as a young man. He lost a lung, was in 
protracted battles with his father for much of his early career until he find a way to overcome and build the business that is John Lewis today. So each of these entrepreneurs understands and proves through the story of their own life that it's not enough to have the audacity of hope. You need the tenacity of hope too. And that's the political lesson that I draw for the economic debates of today. Because look around the world, look around the debate, the truth is that capitalism is not in good odour. Growth is flat, flat on its back. People like Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary in the US, says that we're now mired in this age of secular stagnation. Robert Gordon's just written this whopping great book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth that's got the cheery message that, well, our best days are behind us. Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager, says that the big global businesses that now dominate the commanding heights of the global economy, they're not investing in the economies and the industries and the jobs of the future. So, of course, voters are angry and they're looking for radical solutions from Donald Trump to Brexit. But the lesson of history is this. Entrepreneurs are the answer. We could turn our back on the world. We could try and turn back the clock. We could try and stop the world and get off, but actually it's not going to work. We need the kind of animal spirits to drive the entrepreneurial surge that is going to unlock the industries of the future, whether that is in big data or driverless cars or genetic engineering or the internet of things. You know, you name it. We need the entrepreneurial spirits of this country to turn ideas into new industries and new industries into new jobs. And the truth is that in this country, we've got a hell of a lot going for us. We have two million more businesses than we had at the turn of the century. 40% of Europe's unicorns, those start-up billion dollar businesses, they're based here in the UK. At the next election, there will be more self-employed people in this country than public service workers. But here is the inconvenient truth. We are doing nowhere near enough. We have a million people have left entrepreneurial activity in the last three years alone. We are 48th out of 60 in the global enterprise lead table. Of the top 300 companies created in the last 30 years, only a few of them are British. Look at the top 100 websites, only a couple of them are British and actually they're kind of American, google.co.uk and amazon.co.uk. And that is why we need this big debate about how we create the next generation of world beaters. But I think we need this debate about how we spread enterprise to every school and every college. We need this debate about how we get government buying more from scale-up businesses that create the lion's share of new jobs. We need a finance system that works better. We need to raise the investment we make as a country in science and research and development. We need to get all of these things right because what 600 years of business history teaches you is basically this. Entrepreneurs create history by inventing the future. But if each of us wants a better future in this country, then we need our entrepreneurs not just to fail better, but to succeed.